Hello, hello. You've stumbled into the Andy Social Podcast. My name is Andy Dowling. This is episode 169 with Jan Ryan, a ideas curator, writer, author, angel investor, and much more. We'll get into that very shortly. But first of all, in addition to hosting the Andy Social Podcast, I also play bass in the Australian heavy metal band Lord. And if you're not familiar with us, you can go to lord.net.au, go and give our music a crack. There's video clips, there's a whole back catalogue of our music, um, historical information, there's streaming music there. It's a really easy and quick way to get a taste of what we're all about. For anybody that does know about the band um, and loves a bit of metal, go over to lord.net.au slash united, which is our brand new single, first song off the upcoming album, Fallen Idols, which is due out at the end of April uh, 2019. So make sure you go over there, check it out. Um, the pre-orders for the United t-shirt have now closed, um, and I am recording this a little bit in advance, but I believe they'll be closed by the time this episode comes out. Um, but do not do not fear, uh, pre-orders for the new album and additional new merch will be available very very soon so make sure you go over to lord.net.au slash united or just to the main website make sure you're following us on all the social media platforms and you'll be able to see all the announcements but uh definitely go and give the new single a shot um there's a video clip for it on youtube so you can search on youtube or go through those links and i'd love to know what you think so go and check it out lord.net.au when I get off stage after prancing around in Lord, I also host a second podcast called the Self Starter Podcast. It is all about small business, self-employment, and freelancing. So depending on what you're interested in or what you're doing, you, know, you could have your own your own business, you could have a bit of a side hustle, an interesting way of earning money, um, or you might know somebody, a family member or a friend or a work colleague who just hates their job, keeps talking about getting out, but never quite acts on it, has all these grand, amazing ideas, but just never quite gets there. Self Starter could be for them. It could be for you. Go over to selfstarter.com.au. Uh, you can check out the podcast in your preferred podcast player as well. Season one has wrapped up as of the end of uh, 2018, but season two will kick off around June of this year. So go back and have a listen. There's lots of great case studies and stories from people that are doing amazing things. Um, if you've got guest recommendations for season two, let me know. I'm recording as we speak. So I really want to build up as many episodes in advance for season two to launch. So make sure you uh, make contact with me and let me know, but uh, go and check it all out. Let me know what you think. Selfstarter.com.au. Thank you. This week's shout out. Every week I thank one person that supports me and everything that I do. And it could be anything from a, a simple message of encouragement or a, recommend, a recommendation on Facebook, um, a bit of social media love. It could be buying some merchandise. It doesn't matter. It, it all helps, keeps this thing going. So this week's shout out is for James Walker of Blacktown in Western Sydney. I've been to Blacktown a few times. Uh, James has bought a t-shirt from me, but he hasn't done it through my Bandcamp page. He's actually shot me a DM on Instagram uh, out of all places and has just asked whether he could purchase a, a t-shirt directly from me. So um, done that, hooked him up, shot out a t-shirt. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Um, and by all means, guys, if um, you're not familiar with using Bandcamp, uh, flick me a DM on Instagram or Twitter or Facebook or use the contact form over at andysocial.net. I love that. Um, please use that form if you want to. Um, but whatever it is, it doesn't matter. We can hook it up. We can make it happen. So if you're just not used to using a, partic a particular platform, um, I'm pretty flexible and can make it happen. So by all means, uh, flick me a message if you've got uh, a suggestion of uh, how to how to pick up um, any of the merchandise that I do have available. But uh, James, please flick me a message when you hear this and I will shoot you out some more little goodies in the post because we all love getting something in the mail. Alrighty, folks, this week's episode is with Jan Ryan. Jan is an ideas curator, a writer, a producer, an angel investor. Jan is the founder of Arrow Collective, which is an organization set up to give people an opportunity to directly financially contribute towards a whole range of cultural artistic projects. Jan is also the founding executive producer of TEDx Sydney, uh, is a coach, works with TED Talks in New York, is the co-founder of By Design, which was on ABC Radio for quite a few years. And speaking of ABC, worked for the ABC directly for over 20 years. And the list goes on. It's exhausting. I could just keep going. Um, if you go to Jan's LinkedIn profile, you'll see this mile long list of her achievements, her experience, her collaboration, her projects. It's just been so many great things um, that Jan's been a part of over these years and was a big reason why I wanted to approach her for the podcast because uh, she's just done so much and has been exposed to so many amazing people, stories, and ideas. So 
Luckily for me, Jan said yes, and I met up with her at the work club in Sydney CBD, which is an amazing location, and we talk about it a little bit in this conversation as well. And um, I just picked Jan's brain. <laughs> poor, uh, poor Jan just copped it from me. And, um, I was just really curious to learn, um, of her career to date and what she's been involved with and, um, just some of her insights and perspective. And she just had so much value to give. And I just really, really enjoyed this conversation. So enough waffling on from me. If you want to learn more about Jan, you can go to arrowcollective.org. Um, I'll also give links to Jan's uh, social media pages, including LinkedIn and Twitter, uh, via the show notes over at andysocial.net. And as you guys already know, if you click through on the podcast player, there should be a whole bunch of clickable, clickable links there as well. So um, enough rambling on from me. Please enjoy this really, really cool chat with Jan Lyon. Elizabeth Street, it's a really hot day. It is a really hot day. Yeah. I, I was uh, rushing here yeah. and, um, yeah, I was a little bit flustered when, when I got here, but um, and the heat certainly didn't help, but um, it's, it's nice and it's cooled down in here, so it's much better. I know, it's great. It's air-conditioned. It's fantastic. Uh, we're at the work club. <laughs> yes. Um, I mentioned before to you that the first time here, but it's a, it's a great concept. Um, I think there's a lot of things with uh, industries changing and people finding new ways to work and what... Um, how people work together or individually and um, hot desks are a big thing and remote working and I certainly do a lot of work from home and all over the place so it's sort of an extension of a lot of those concepts. Yeah look the the, the really good thing about work club and working um, out of work club it's it's collaborative. Mm. And I think this is the way that we're all working. We need to work with each other. And we also need to have the confidence to find our way into the spirit of the person sitting next to us, yep. you know, perhaps talk to them. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's often really quite hard for people to sort of say hello to someone next to them. Because uh, in the old days, you know, there was a sense that that would be, you know, that was people wanted their privacy. Mm. But I, I'm not sure that that's the case now. And I think we do have to learn to open up more and work with others and make projects together and uh, work club is an example of people working on startups and working by themselves and leaving big organizations and trying to think wow what am i doing mm. and you know seat of the pants kind of stuff so it's good have you seen a lot of a lot of that happening more often now than ever before yes definitely i think it's uh, work club i started here th uh, three years ago yeah. and uh, that was the beginning of work club and uh, i think while there were co-sharing spaces and there's a sense in some corporations like macquarie bank for mm. example was designing their workplaces around uh, people bumping up against each other yep. and um, not having a desk or an mm. office that they could retreat to. So there was a lot of experimentation going on uh, in the world of architecture and design. And I think uh, at the kind of leading edge, and obviously, you know, things went right and things went wrong and on, on many levels, but the thing that went right for everyone is that all corporations and all individuals, and I worked at the ABC, for example, and mm. we knocked down all our walls and you know did what we called open plan <laughs> how did how did that go down when um that and there happened? was a real struggle yeah. i think for a lot of people then and that was about four years ago okay. when that happened and it seems like a lifetime ago now but again the same principles of trying to bring people uh in with different mindsets together so breaking down uh, literally and metaphorically the mindsets between culture and science and sitting mm. science reporters next to arts yeah. reporters and all that just sounds a little bit sort of cute on some levels but uh, the idea was that really we were one organism and we needed to respect and know each other and share knowledge as much as our own spirit with each other and that's a big learning curve because of the hierarchy mm. uh, in organ traditional 20th century uh, corporations like the ABC and you know nearly all law mm. I'll use that as an example because I work there but uh, all corporations have a hierarchy where you know in the old days the the higher you went the more prestigious your office and the more isolated you got mm. and the more s people who had to answer to you or serve you and and that is not like that here at work club i mean we have to find our way of respecting what the person next to us is doing and 
you know, I've met some great people here and they've really, really helped me um, shift into new jobs and take a risk with things and uh, listen to you. It's quite interesting. I've certainly seen it over the years, um, working in traditional environments where, and it's very, it's very much a buzzword, but the silo, mm. where you've got a function of a department and a collective of people and they're there to serve a particular purpose. And while, as you said, it's an organism as far as an entire corporation or entire business, people are more focused on their own agenda, their own metrics and things that they've got to perform against. But a lot of opportunities are missed because you 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 miss those other indicators where another function in the business could actually improve what you're doing and i certainly noticed where a lot of um, even just within one organization and that those examples are very similar to what i've seen where people are forced to have to work together that normally would never converse and never interact with each other and whether it be a seating arrangement or uh, regular sort of collaborations of meetings and things like that to get people or off sites and things just to get people interacting with um, other individuals that are looking at something from a slightly different angle and even uh, recruiting. Um, you know, you would recruit from traditionally the same industry that you're already working in and then you scratch your head wondering why there's no progress or why you've got the same problems. And I've seen a lot of people looking outside of their, their own home, their own industry and finding and I hate the word, but talent um, mm -hmm. from other industries that can come in and say, wow, how about you try this and just completely shift the, the culture um, and the, the, the output and the mission that, that that business and that industry already has. Yes, I, I think um, this is the big shift. Mm -hmm. uh, the shift is within this, it kind of actually is a bigger shift than that. It's about how do we become people that we haven't yet been, but yep. we have the potential to be. And uh, that, uh, you know, has its ups and downs mm. in the real life of yes. sitting next to someone at a desk. <laughs> but uh, I think that's the important change that we're going through in the workplace. Um, I work for TED as mm. well, and um, we, I recently worked with a big project, a partnership they did with Westpac, okay. TED at yep. Westpac, and uh, you know, we, we did all our meetings in what we call the TED campfire, which was in it's, it's TED, the main TED mm. offices in New York, and we, I was in Australia and, and Westpac was too. But the point of this is that we were actually working um, uh, through, you know, through our uh, computers we were working online and going into what we called the campfire so actually it really felt like being in an open plan office and often each day when I pulled up my screen to enter the, into the campfire yep. where we would talk and share mm. with a, a diverse range of people who had skills way as you were saying you know totally you know one day you might be working with an astrophysicist the mm. next day you're working with someone who's just trying to work out the practicalities of how to make the office work or yep. something you know but it but the point being that the skill set and the thinking is what what you, what one is looking at but again the architecture comes into this which is working through if you look through mm. here at work club now and just to explain where we are we're just looking across through um, panels of glass for you know a long way down the corridor um, that's like being online with your computer when you kind of go in and so you start to see long lines of um, open space when the other person has their computer up and they may be all around Australia and in New York for example it doesn't really matter where you are the point is is the architecture of the, like this is a visual architecture that we're in now um, and this this is the thing that um, structures the way that we are open to think so all these things are connected, mm. you know, our dreams and ambitions to be greater uh, together than we are apart. You know, we are stronger together than we are apart. Um, but how does that represent itself? So you'll start to see in, in 21st century workplaces and businesses, th these visual metaphors of things starting to open up. And I think it does affect us. I think when you walk in and you see this and you look through here, if we have the screen up and we were talking to someone who was down the other end of the room and coming back at us, we'd start to see the reflections mm. back and forth. Absolutely. Um, and it's, it's, it's not hard actually, but, but it's probably been 
a hundred years of thinking to get to this stage. That's right. And I think one thing that I've certainly noticed, I think just as a general sort of social observation is that there's a level of vulnerability at the moment as well, where everybody's going through these changes. And I think, you know, that whole exponential um, progress of technology and everything happening around us, that everybody's looking to shift quick. Yes. Um, and some people, it's you know, they absolutely they grab it and run with it and doing amazing things. But a lot of a lot of people struggle with it because there's a level of comfort that is is no longer there. And mm -hmm. so it's trying to find that balance where you can bring everyone along and not leave anybody behind. But it's um, we certainly know so just day to day sort of things where like even that example of of taking down the walls in the office. Some yeah. some people would, would have looked around with this is fantastic, and other people would have grumbled and said, "Oh, everyone can see what I'm doing now." And they do. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but look, that's true. But does it matter that people can see what you do? This no, is what I'd right. always say. I don't care if you see what I do because you know it's pretty modest. You know. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, uh, that that's, comes back to the privacy thing, and yeah. that's that's a big issue. Mm. Uh, and uh, but I think you know there's less and less privacy at that level. Mm. Um, you know, Facebook and all these yep. groups, uh, all these companies are dealing with issues of privacy. Mm. Uh, but that's really something that is really being contested and 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 again privacy is something that was constructed in the first place and who has the right to know what and where yeah. you know so there's many many sort of class issues and cultural issues and all sorts of things all the barriers that are, seem to be invisible but they're not in practice uh, are shifting as we give each other access to who we are yeah. and trust Trust Absolutely. is another thing, and again, that's a bit of a cliche, but um, that comes out of that, hmm. uh, our level of understanding what we're trusting. And I think when you've got, going back to the concept of mixing uh, ideas and perspectives, insights together with um, people of all walks of life, you start to have more, an increased level of trust and compassion for other people because you can start to see things from multiple yes. um, angles instead of yeah. just that one dimensional approach that you've always grown up. That's your environment. That's what you've been, that's what you studied. That's what you work. That's what you do on a day to day basis. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's a very, wow. It's big, isn't it? It is. Oh, <laughs> we went, we went deep quick on this one. <laughs> How do we get out of this? Well, I was going to say like a big thing with, with the having multiple sort of insights from different people um and please like help me sort yeah. of uh describe this but arrow collective arrow yes is from at least from my point of view and i don't know a lot about it um but appears to be a number of different people that are coming together from different backgrounds and are using their skills and resources to be able to get behind things with purpose and 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 make things become a reality that might I guess in a normal set of circumstances may not ever eventuate. Yeah. So um, Arrow is an Arrow Collective is uh, a, a vision to advocate and to fund things that haven't yet been imagined. And this is in the cultural space, mm. but you could apply the principles and uh, anywhere. Mm. Um, so for the last uh, 10 years, uh, we've been... Um, funding cultural cultural projects mm. and we've learned how to do that and we've uh, worked with really incredible partners you need good partners mm. nothing happens alone right. together we're stronger than we are apart so uh, just to come step one step back in in there before I talk about the partners it's actually anyone can come into the arrow collective there's no uh, it's just a matter of I mean it does cost a thousand dollars to be part of our project but if hundred people come in and we get a thousand dollars from a hundred people we've got a hundred thousand dollars mm. that together uh, people can see things come to life and participate in cultural vision mm. and risk yeah, uh, that one person couldn't do because they wouldn't have a hundred thousand mm. dollars so the brand arrow does the deal does the branding deal and then we just go about you know <laughs> and hope for the best hope mm. that people will come on and that they'll they'll love our vision and 
uh, they like to be part of it and so we've had great partnerships with um, our very first partnership was with Sydney Youth Orchestras uh, then we moved to the Australian Chamber Orchestra which was a very big mm. and exciting partnership for us because for me in particular because I learnt so much from them uh, by being see if you partner well mm. you partner and you learn from them and you know they learn from you and and we funded uh, a couple of pieces of music with the ACO and Richard Tonietti one of them was called The Reef um, which uh, is just an amazing concept they went on a road trip to make some music uh, in Ningaloo Reef in Western Australia and um, it was going to be all sorts of things they're going to take a film crew and finless surfers and all this was not a traditional commission mm. Um, and it wasn't uh, something that their normal funders jumped at, yep. but I thought this was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought this was the greatest risk that we could yep. take. So I'm really interested in risk, taking a risk. Keep in mind, I have a really strong background in curating culture mm. with the ABC. So I didn't, didn't come from this accidentally. You're going in completely blind. Yeah, yeah. no. So, uh, but I had great confidence in this. And long story short, they went away and they thought they're going to make a 10 minute piece of music. And they made two hours of stuff and they traveled and had road accidents and surfing and traveled through the Kimberley and worked with indigenous musicians and. Uh, and it beca became called The Reef and it first first outing was a couple of hours in Darwin. Everything broke down and it was all kind of crazy. <laughs> but Richard Tonietti is, this is where it's good working with great people. He and the, the ACO, they just so disciplined and this is where I really, you know, really aligned with, yep. was aligned with them because I knew that to make things, to make dreams come true, it doesn't matter whether it's culture or, you know, you're doing physics or mm. wh whatever. It doesn't doesn't matter at all. The principle's the same. To make dreams come true, uh, which you can, mm. <laughs> uh, you're disciplined, focused, persistent, uh, resilient, and you never give up. Okay, so that's they're the rules, yep. <laughs> and it, you have a lot of strange and peculiar days where people think you're mad. Yep. <laughs> But, you know, this reef became an absolute turning point for the ACO um, and uh, we were part of it and we were there. I mean, it doesn't get much better than that. Yeah. 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 And then we got this amazing project called Dance Rights at the Sydney Opera House, which really, I mean, wow, that's been incredible. So uh, that's all been part of the Arrow Collective, but Dance Rights is an indige national indigenous dance competition on the top of the surface, mm. but underneath it's to go into every community in Australia and bring to life uh, dances and rituals and markings and cultural things that have been forgotten and passed down from elders to, to young ones. So it's cross-generational. It's, it's really ambitious. Rhoda Roberts is the cure. She that's her vision, and we came in on that with her. And now four years later, we've seed funded that, and it's a standalone event at the Sydney Opera House each year. Mm. But it yep. operates in the communities through the year. We've got Westpac now on as a partner that embraces dance rights. We really didn't have the financial capacity to take it further once we'd given birth to it. Hmm. That's often the case with us. Yep. You need for great projects and for any startup, be it whatever it might be, but uh, cultural ones is what we do. Um, you have to truly get it going. You know, one-off things are not enough. You never make or change your culture by just one thing. You gotta make it sustainable in it's some way. It's gotta be sustainable and if we're going to hear the world differently or see the world differently or imagine the world differently, and that includes, uh, I suppose, on a political level, who are we as Australians mm. or just what is the spirit of our time? Yep. Um, we have, we make it. Yep. No Absolutely. one else does it. That's right. <laughs> so um, it doesn't come from the sky. 
it comes from the day to day of people like us. Yep. E- every person can participate. But I realised when I was at the ABC, uh, which I uh, re- relatively recently mm. left, um, and I was working with Ted all the way through that time as well. And that is another example of a something there was nothing yep. and and it grew. So all this was happening in the one time and it was when I look back, I can see that, oh, that is amazing. How could that be? It didn't feel like that at the time. <laughs> felt like really hard work. But um, it was a time of opportunity in terms of making things and the ABC had taught me that you, all if you uh, keep your eyes and ears open and if you take a risk, mm. uh, you know, you take the chance. Yep. Um, so I realised that at the ABC, as an executive producer and producer, I was curating quite elite culture. I felt that what we were, we didn't make culture as such, we curated stories. Mm. And uh, I became... I struggled deeply with the fact that I felt that I was making culture for very privileged people, even though the ABC is for everyone. Mm. Uh, The reality on the floor is that people like me made those projects, uh, uh, programs and things. And I worked at Radio National, which is, you know, a great place to work, but it has a particular audience Mm. and brief. And I I really struggled with it. And... um, I wanted to be part of finding a new way of putting voice to it that wasn't just words. I know it's, it doesn't really make much sense, but it did in, inside me, and I started doing these other things. And I thought, oh, that's what I want to do. Like that's it's almost been like a natural extension of yeah. like a sequence of events. As you said, looking back now, you can see where things yes, linking yeah. together. So obvious now. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> but it, it's it's almost like this natural progression where you've. You've had this taste of, of doing it in a capacity, but of obviously ident- identifying the limitations of it, and but wanting to push past that. And yeah. so this has been well. This is the next sort of natural step is to to go out there and see. Because the question I was going to one of the questions I was going to ask is the collective itself. Has it come from being approached from external parties looking to get that boost and to get support, or was it the the want to go out there and search for? for those stories and those people to be able to find and and assist others? Uh, It's very hard to find a risky project, Mm. believe it or not. You'd think that'd be... You wouldn't think so. No, you wouldn't think so. But the way that the culture is structured, there's only a few places that make music or, you know, make dance or make art. We're going into the first public art commission with the Sydney Opera House this year 2019 they're not an opera ha- so they're not they're an, <laughs> they're an opera house they're not an art gallery yep. uh, but to do some seed funding work and try and find new ways of imagining the way we look mm. but it's hard I I've been at this for a long time and I I either I'm blind <laughs> which is possible um, but it's it, you often get stuff where people trust what's come before Right. Okay. So, if, for example, if you're buying a, a house, you might not go for the latest architecture, for example, unless you particularly understand that and only a handful of people mm. in the universe understand that because it's expensive as well as risky. So people will go where others have been before. And some of it is fashionable and desirable and beautiful and, you know, there's no reason not to do that. But our brief is to try and find something that has the risk of possibly it, it, it doesn't sound right or it doesn't look right or there's, you know, what the hell, you know. Uh, and I'm really interested in how it happens across the community rather than just, you know, refined space. Again, all these things are quite hard to do mm. uh, and to get the right partner to leverage the um, confidence in taking the risk. So the Opera House, for example, has been a great partner for Arrow. 
I mean, it has taken the risks. Mm. It's public culture. It's owned yep. by you and me. They're rare now. Absolutely. There's very That's few right. places where there's public culture. Uh, there's stuff that's owned privately or through organisations that means that the footprint of change of who we are, the way music mm. changes, the way we see things, the way we wear different yep. clothes or whatever it is, you mm. know, it has to be created by someone. It has to be given voice. Yep. And it's hard to find those. It is because it's people really are very quietly going about their lives and, and they just don't want to disrupt it. The least amount of friction possible. Yeah, the just least to, amount. That's right. So um, dance rights, for example, has changed the lives of many Indigenous Australians around Australia. It's only at the beginning of its mm. life. It's only four years old. Uh, and we're looking at the social impact of that across the communities yep. with the brand Sydney Opera House mm -hmm. travelling with it. So it's the first project that has ever travelled under the culture brand with Sydney Opera House because mm. prior, in the previous four years, it was really a house for hire. Right, okay. It wasn't a cultural brand yep. that, that curated mm. stuff like dance rights. Yep. So that's a massive shift. Big thing. Yeah. for an organisation that is actually a building mm. up until now. Just adds to the, what's the right word? It's already an iconic It's so name iconic. and branding and everything. And branding mm. makes it sound so artificial, but... Um, no, the branding is critical. But, absolutely. Yeah. And so it, it adds to, it just gives so much more to to fund, well, funding, not just in a financial it, way, just but just a everything. weight yep. and a trust. That's right. So. Sydney Opera House, for example, is really profound and very profound for us at Arrow, Arrow because it's the most known Australian, one of the most known Australian brands, full mm. stop. When, when around the world, when people Global. see the, yep. uh, the icon, everyone knows that's mm. the Sydney Opera House. So anything that we do and we can build globally, uh, we can do, a, in a sense, content mm. uh, uh, through the media brand of mm. the Sydney Opera Absolutely. House. It doesn't see itself as a media brand, mm. but in fact, it's a global media brand in the way that the ABC hasn't grown to that level. Mm. If you go to America, they don't know what the ABC yep. is, but they will know when they see the Sydney Opera House. So you can see the potential for that brand and you can see the power of what that can do for culture that finds its beginning in Australia. And that's where we're interested to be, at the beginning of that in Australia. We, we're happy to seed fund that um, with the Sydney Opera House. But I, I just don't know anything better than it really. It's been an amazing experience and learning curve and really, wow, you know, like, who would have thought? But you take the risk and, yeah. you know, could all fail. And I'm sure there's a few failures ahead. <laughs> but, definitely. But I mean, that's, that's where growth comes from. And yes. you've, and I think going back to what a lot of people do, and I've certainly been victim, not victim of this, probably not the right word, but I've fallen into the trap of trying to cruise through in the least amount of friction possible. And, mm. and there's a level of comfort there, but I think there's also an underlying and sometimes it's subconscious, but this level of uh, restlessness and tension and stress because you're not you're not striving for anything you're not pushing in you're not taking those risks because that's where that's where all the learning comes from that's yeah, where all the growth comes from and for something like arrow and and in most of the things I've, I've seen that you've been involved with over the years and even the ABC and I understand some of those limitations towards the end or thinking mm. where you want to go there's a lot of fulfilling work that you've been involved with y yes well TEDx Sydney was Another lucky break. Mm, yeah. <laughs> uh, Ramo Gifre, who's the licensee for TEDx Sydney, and I bumped into each other in the street one day in a 2009, I think it was, like 10 years ago. <laughs> and um, I just don't know how it happened, to be honest. I look back and I, like, that was the most 
incredible team that we built and uh, it's just getting the right team players. Mm. Team players are very important. You've got to be quite different. You can't be the same. Yep. Because otherwise there's too much competition between Absolutely. people <laughs> rather right. than Everyone's like... Everyone's got a similar agenda. And, yeah, yeah, I mean, if you start working with other journalists, they'll just try and beat the pants off you, you know. <laughs> yeah. But you work with Remo, for example, who's a brilliant marketer and understands brand and, like, you know, you start to build... Uh, it was just the most brilliant team. And I learned so much from those... Uh, Years. Uh, I really am an alumni now and a mm. founder of TEDx Sydney, and we've built a new team. So part of the learning curve is building new teams as well because it's a not for profit. It's so sustainability once again. Yeah, there's yeah. Sense, it's yeah. really important that you learn in this world as well that you've got to teach others. Yep. Yeah, and also arrows come, all these things come out of these mm. things. They wouldn't have happened. Uh, in the same way. So TEDx Sydney, which everybody knows that brand, mm. okay, so, uh, but nobody did at the beginning. Mm. I can assure you, everybody, I was the executive producer of TEDx Sydney and curator, and, and I'd ring people up and they'd go, what is this? TED, that's a silly name. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, you know, like they just didn't know it yep. at all. I would just became so kind of obsessed with this. And as we all did in the team, you know, there was no sleep. I felt like I, I, it was, I imagined one day I was walking down the street late at night at Bondi where I used to walk, you know, like 10 or 11 o'clock at night. And I thought, I know this must have been what it felt like to go to Woodstock in the 60s in America, like, you know, Jimi Hendrix and, you know, like the, the, this is what, t to me, TEDx Sydney felt like, but no it's one else. cultural wave. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. But yeah. only a few of us knew yeah, that. Right. You see what I mean? It was like my little sort of way of justifying this madness. And so I used to, my title of being an executive produ producer, but uh, people used to call me the evangelical pastor <laughs> <laughs> because, I, you know, it was so persistent. Yeah. But look, it broke through, it found made ground, it had the support of the TED brand. Yep. It wasn't like a, a homegrown invented brand. So it had a global support mm. and and we got, I think, number six or seven license in the world for TEDx. Now there's six or seven thousand mm. licenses. Mm. And it's now moved to a whole another level now. Whole mm. other level. And I realise, of course, that I love being on a startup. It's great being back to being an evangelical pastor, you know what I mean? <laughs> I, I, I mean, there, there are other people who, with all startups and all businesses, uh, you've got to have the right person at the right time, you know? Like, I, I don't think I would be the right person to come into the team now, hmm. for example, say TEDx Sydney, because I, uh, my spirit is in the startup. It, it, and others are better at building the new, you know. And that's the awareness building. of having your strength. Like that's yeah. that's where your strengths lie. Yeah, you, and I've learnt this mm. in the last ten years in particular, where your strength lies, and when you let go to someone whose strengths may be to steer your company or your corporation or whatever it might be, your business to to the next level. Like after seven years, mm. I was talking seven year cycles in these these situations that so you know like the startup person may not be the person who should take it to the next yep. step and it, it's a very hard thing to recognize in yourself you know because letting go letting go and you know you've put your life around it um and i really wanted to learn how to do that and so ted gave me the opportunities to to do that and i mean uh, uh, it, it, it's just pretty, pretty amazing. And I know I'm, I'm sounding evangelical <laughs> as I speak, <laughs> but I'm going back into the spirit of where we, where we were. And um, I, I always encourage people to just like take the chance, but you have to learn how to take the chance. It's one thing to say to people, uh, listen, there's a great idea there or, you know, come back with a good idea or mm. pitch a good idea that's you do have to learn how to have an idea. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I, I was lucky enough to, to learn those things and meet people along the way, especially in the last decade, who've really taught me those things. And, you know, here at Work Club, I meet them every day. Do you think that 
it's, a, it's an odd question, but it's, in, it, it's stuck in my mind at the moment. Is it about the I, I was going to say what makes a good idea, but it's almost, it's partially the idea itself, but it's, it's the framework around the idea that sort of separates it and gives it the power that it has. So going back to some of the comments that you've made about partnerships and mm. putting people around you and having the mm. right support and thinking about sustainability and, and all these sort of things. Because I think, I think most people out there, if um, you give them a piece of paper, they'll scribble something down and everyone's got a great idea and everyone's got an opinion as well, which yeah. that's another thing altogether. Yeah, yeah. But the difference between that and it becoming a reality is there's a big gap it's in fast. between. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, well, um, I think if you start quite young, so, uh, you know, I know education models are changing. Mm. And uh, I think in a culture like we're now in, especially in places like Australia, where there's so much opportunity, yep. but a lot of it, I think, is around a lack of confidence. Mm. And confidence is something that is really hard to put your finger on. <laughs> um, but and some people do it better than others, and I've really tried to work out why. Mm. I, I, I think it's learnt way back. I think it's probably a family thing. So if, you know, families get better at trusting their kids yep. and or their own thoughts or get them going young, like mm. don't give everything to your kids, make them invent something, right. you yep. know, and, and be that part of what... what what your family does, because you've got to learn somewhere. Mm. I mean, and the best place to learn is when you're a little kid and you don't have the same inhibitions or fears Absolutely. that you might have when you're older. So mm. that's just being practical. Um, and and again, I, 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 I really don't know, but a lot of people push back and when you start mm. speaking about how an idea that they might work on, they pull away from it because mm. I think it's because they don't have the confidence they're not ready for whatever reason. Not everyone can have a great idea, you know, yep. or, or some people would rather work with someone who's got a great idea. Mm. So there are different roles for people. But we are moving into a time where we can't afford to lose good ideas. I mean, uh, there's a space for everybody yep. in this, but it's often given to privilege mm. or rogue and random outsiders, you know. That's right. But... and. They're beautiful people, uh, but not we, always relatable, though. It's, no, but um, you know that the, the, there's more that comes out of a space of privilege often because you know people have had a chance to do something like a physics degree or you know go to university mm. or whatever yep. something that puts them in a culture of discovery. Yep. And that's what, you know, you have to find that sort of magic in, oh, is this possible? Or, oh, my God, yeah, really? Yeah, is this how it's constructed? You know, it, it, it's like you work out that you can be an, an author in your culture by imagining something. And that, even as I say it, I think, oh, gee whiz, that's, you know, that's a tall order. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but if I think about it, I think that's what I've really made my life's work without even knowing. Mm. Um, uh, mind you, I was pretty sleepy in some places and got a sudden burst about 10 years ago. <laughs> Late in life, I like, whoa, hang on to your hat. Um, but and uh, if I had a regret, it would be that I didn't wake up earlier. I, I don't know why I wasn't as awake as I should have been. But uh, again, I, I don't know. See, I don't know. I think people come into themselves in different ways mm. uh, at different times. So think... that's the great thing about, you know, a, a, a lot, a, you know, not just privileging young kids, mm. but everybody comes in to a wave. So you shouldn't see people as uh, not able to work anymore or whatever, you know, like they, that people shouldn't be seeing their life through the prism of uh, working. They should see that things happen in strange ways That's in right. life. They do. That's right. <laughs> to and, everyone. And there's no, I think this is what a lot of people struggle with is that there's a, I think, and this has been just sort of a cultural thing in a lot of a lot of the Western world anyway, but there's a lot of structure. We need, there's a, there's a certain set of processes or steps that most people follow their life along and 
um, and I can only sort of reflect on my own experiences mm. living here in Australia, but um, I think we compare each other, like we compare what other people are doing. And um, when you grow up and you've got um, a peer or a friend that might be um, ticking off those particular things on the list of life, you know, it might be um, you know, getting through a particular subject at school or graduating, going to university, or it might be buying a home, having a family, the different things that are very traditional and expected in life. And so we kind of think, and I think there's a lot of limitations and it is changing where people think that once they get to a certain stage in their life, then those opportunities reduce. Yes. And I think there's, it's all, over. there's yeah, absolutely. absolutely. <laughs> and I think, and I, but it's, it's scary because people are so young and they're coming up and they're having these, these narratives in their head and it's stopping them from doing anything. And it gets them into this mundane um, existence where it's just the the typical day-to-day -day, um, grayness of, of life. And I've certainly noticed in the last few years uh, where I guess the exchange of information is a lot easier. People can see not just in their local area, in their community, but they can see across the country and globally to see what other people are doing and go, wow, like if, if that person can do it, then maybe I can. And I assume that'd be like with TEDx, where you've got so many different people that are on that stage coming from the most unexpected backgrounds yes. and finding these moments of, of whatever the, the basis of their, their talk is, whether it be from adversity or success or whatever it might be, but showing people that there is the extraordinary. But I think for the most part, we're, we're all very, very similar. And it yes. teaches a lot. Yeah. Um, so how does one person get pulled out to do a TED talk, for example? Mm. Uh, again... Hmm. And there's a, a kind of randomness to that and an opportunity is pe people uh, position themselves mm. with an idea. They do take a risk on something, um, you know, some new way of imagining the world or some experience they might have as a teacher or, you know, every yep. day people can uh, or, uh, you know, fighting back from adversity mm. in an incredible way. And they get your attention, uh, but yes, look, not it, not everyone can do a TED talk. No, that's right. Uh, and and that's because there's just you know only so many TED talks that, <laughs> that can be done. Um, but but people can, you know, like for example, TED has made uh, a. a a huge contribution to the world, and uh, one of the resistances that it, that that I experienced early on was that it was an American cultural mm. project, yep. and in Australia, people were still seeing their ideas coming through a European context, mm. which was more masculine, yep. um, more mediated through universities and uh, uh, broadcasting outlets like the ABC, mm. myself as a producer, dealt with all these people. A little bit conservative in and, a way, well, the right it, word. But. It may not have necessarily been conservative, but it was structured in that yep. way. So Ted came along and it was seen as evangelical. It, it, the ideas were driven through the experience of mm. the person doing the talk. Yep. They weren't sort of references with footnotes and, you know, someone who became the authority because they just were. The ordinary person could be the authority and the extraordinary person at mm. the same time, but this, this, the key thing with a TED Talk and the key shift was a kind of an American imperialism around mm. ideas and around emotions yep. that you would speak from the heart. And somehow in in Australia at that time, Australia's grown and changed as a result of this, but at that time it was seen as um, more evangelical, mm. uh, less valid and slightly suspicious mm. because it was American, mm. okay? And it was across race. There was much more diversity, yep. diversity in the voices, and uh, in the context of Australia, it was like a little bit dangerous. Mm. And I, I'll tell you a story. It always amuses me when I think of it myself. But 
Way back in the beginning, before anyone knew there was Ted, yep. okay? <laughs> and only I and you know, a few of us, Remo and a few of us around, we knew because we were a little club, yep. you know, our little team. And um, I went to one of my colleagues at the ABC who I really respected, and I deeply respected this person. And I <laughs> went in there and I closed the door behind me and I said, Joe. I want you to tell me the truth. And he said, well, yeah, sure, Jan. Do you think Ted's a cult? <laughs> <laughs> and he said, why do you ask that? And I said, well, I ask that because, you know, nobody knows what I'm doing and, you know, it seems to have escaped, you know, the concept of outside work at the ABC. I seem to have, all doors are open to me because I don't think they thought it was anything. You know, normally <laughs> you'd be told you couldn't work somewhere yeah. because you'd take up too much time. But I seem to, I just, no one knew what it was. And and he said, hmm, that's interesting. Um, and I said, well, I just, you know, I'm just worried I might have joined a cult. <laughs> And um, it just seems laughable now, but because we were so alone, you know, in this space. But now when I look back, I can see what was happening. It was the, the, the cultural shift that was being t um, uh, in the intellectual world that was being brought through the prism of TED. Mm. And, you know, Andy Dowling is doing a talk on, you know, imagination and, uh, right, okay, you know. Uh, <laughs> So, Strapping. You, you, you know what I mean? Like, who's Andy Dowling? <laughs> and why is he doing the talk? Why isn't Professor X doing yep. the talk? And uh, I said, oh, well, because, you know, he's, he's, he's really, he speaks from the heart, you know, <laughs> and you can see all this sort of stuff. I really laugh when I think about it because um, it's completely transformed our culture and it's completely transformed our world. It's a way of talking now and it's a way of getting... Um, ideas across however it's going through a change and the brand will evolve mm. radically but way back 10 years ago when you know only three people in the world mm. knew what it was outside of the elite in silicon very, valley you very know daunting very daunting uh, I guess. it was when i look back i guess but i didn't feel i didn't wasn't daunted see i don't have a great radar for being daunted <laughs> 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 I guess, it, I mean, it's a lot, a lot of these things and I know one of the titles, which I, I love because I've never really seen it referred to anybody, but an, an ideas curator. Yeah. And a, a lot of a lot of what we're speaking about is ideas yes. and executing on ideas. So even with the, the concept of TEDx, it's, it's the idea of launching this, yes. but it's the idea of putting a platform for more people to express ideas. Yes. Um, so it's collaborative. Absolutely. And collective. Yeah. And that's where the Arrow, Arrow, yeah. Arrow Collective has come out of that, um, using that platform, I guess. And I do believe that we are um, stronger mm. if, we're, if we're a yep. collective of people. Um, you know, collaborate collaborate with great projects and ideas. And I do call myself an ideas curator because that's what I am. And, you know, I kind of always going through what passes as an idea. Mm. See, ideas are created, mm. that they don't appear out of the ground yep. or anything. And so it's constructing a narrative around ways of thinking mm. and ideas and structures and things. So I'm, I'm really interested in how narratives get created. And when I work with people and, you know, in my life, I do work with a few people now increasingly who want the narrative of their brand or the narrative of their story. You know, this is, I did one the other day a very senior academic, and um, and he was amazing because I thought, gee, that that's a profound shift where we're talking about how he can describe himself and what it what it is in that description that he needs to be aware of and validate, mm. like it's not fake. Um, how true is it when he says that of himself or in, in herself or ourselves? So. Recasting. It's a big change, isn't it? Yeah, recasting what a, what your job is. In this case, it was in the academic world. Looking at the the boundaries of that, 
the way in which you would imagine what that is because if you imagine it differently and you believe in it you will change the world for all of those students that come past you and within you know within your course or you know your world it doesn't have to be the way it was 10 years ago or even five years mm. ago so it's being more entrepreneurial yeah. again but but you you can't make it up that's right it has to be true so you have to rehearse the way the words sound and how you feel when you say it mm. so that's ideas curating narrative driven um it could be called a brand yeah so it's not so mysterious when you look at it like that. It's very, I mean, it's very mechanical in a sense. It is. It's and very practical. Yep. You've got to unpick it and mm. do it. You've got to speak the words. You've got to hear your voice. Um, and then once you get that right, you you know, you can really change your confidence. It's a big cultural shift, I think, in a lot of the Western world. I, Especially in Australia, where and I've and for people that listen to this podcast, they're probably sick of me uh, referring to this, but that that whole old tall puppy syndrome mm. thing, where I think for for many years we were only as good as what we put out there, um, mm. but we were very disconnected from our work. So the work was what was important, wasn't the person behind it, um, and anybody that tried to put themselves up there as an individual aligned with their work was sort of cut back down to size because why would you think that you as an individual are important enough to be highlighted with with the output um, and I think people now are starting to see the value in in and, and the confidence to be able to put themselves out there and say this is me as a holistic uh, you know view of everything that I believe in and, and my knowledge and my expertise and that narrative that I've constructed around myself and the best selling technique for any sort of concept or idea is to make it personable and put somebody attached to it. So I think a lot more people are, are embracing it now. And I think that it's still there, but I, I don't think it's, a, it's as prevalent as it has been in the past with people putting their head out a little bit more and putting their name against something. Yeah. Uh, um, Travelling alongside that uh, is, yes, there's the personal uh, brand mm. and ego and voice. Mm. Um, but what, how, how that separates from what might have happened 10 years ago or 30 years ago is that now you have to be, you can't remain alone with that voice. The yep. voice is only strengthened by being with others mm. who um, enhance it yep. and, and, and you open your heart to that. So. Um, again, it's that's like together we're stronger than we are apart. So one person may make a great breakthrough um, and uh, they may be at the University of New South Wales in Sydney, for mm. example, and there'll be many people working on that. But usually, and I put my money on this, probably always, those ideas have come out of teamwork mm. and that leader has to surrender his or her ego to the work, mm. not to, because they didn't do the work per yep. se. Their work has come out of the collaborative process over time. Um, and nine times out of 10, there'll be, you know, five people on a team doing something like that. So the one person may often speak for that work, but I think a generous way of doing it would be to train up the others so they can speak on it too. Mm. And there's an understanding of uh, how you acknowledge the teamwork um, rather than just one breakthrough. Because even with things that seem like one breakthrough, they're probably nine times out of 10 or 99 times out of 100 uh, come from a whole lot of experiences that have led to that. And from different inputs. Yes, mm. and one person may just have been more able to talk, more confident or something. But look, I think we have to investigate those things and again, work in rolling teams of stuff. And it, it will bring us back to more community, I think too, which is one thing that people seem to be struggling with at the moment. I think it's sort of like a shift. Where yeah. We've gone from, from one extreme to the other where a lot of people have really become intoxicated with the idea of being that entrepreneur and going out and doing something, putting their name against something, putting their name out there and being 
having the confidence, but that vulnerability of, of really sort of backing themselves on an idea. But then that can also lead to a lot of problems if you're on your own. And I think now to find that sort of middle ground is to is to bring it back a bit and mm. really embrace the fact that, yes, absolutely, you can go out there and, and work on an idea and make something happen, but it it does come down to a whole range of different inputs and these types of environments here help cultivate a lot of a lot of that as well so um you know even even for me with this little podcast that i do you know i i rely on other people um, in order for it to to be a reality yes and i think for me if i had create a narrative in my head that i was the only person capable of doing everything then there's probably a very high probability that this podcast wouldn't still be going yeah. um and i've and i continue to push myself to un- and let go of particular things because i know there's going to be other people out there that can add value to what i'm doing <coughs> and increase the quality or increase uh the output of, of of what it is yeah definitely i mean i just don't think it's ever going to be great mm. if you do stuff by yourself yep um I mean, it might be great doing it by yourself, but whatever it is that you do won't be great yep. because it, it's just, there's it, just, it, and also it's lovely working with people, you know? I mean, it's, it's, it's a beautiful way of, of sharing the world. And I think that, I think it's nothing happens alone. Well, Jan, I think it's a good way to wrap it up and I will put links to Arrow, TEDx, everything you've been involved with. And I was, and forgive me, I was stalking your LinkedIn profile. I'm looking at going, oh, wow, you, you've done you've done quite a bit. Um, we didn't even get into, I mean, we did touch a little bit on architecture, but um, you've got a long history yeah. in, in that as well. And I'll put some, put some links in there. But uh, Jan, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Oh, it's a great pleasure. Thank you, Andy. If you want to learn more about Jan and the Arrow Collective or anything that Jan's been involved with over the years, I'll have everything in the show notes over at andysocial.net. You can also go to arrowcollective.org. And as always, um, if you're listening to this through a mobile and using a podcast player, you should be able to either scroll down or click through to the show notes and there'll be a bunch of clickable links there to all of Jan's details and all the things that she's been a part of and everything we spoke about in this chat as well. So make sure you go and check it out. And if you enjoyed the chat, as always, like I say, with every episode, on this podcast, please reach out to the guests, reach out to Jan and let her know what you thought of this uh, chat because it was just such a great, great conversation for me to have. And I'm just so thankful that uh, Jan was able to give me some of her precious time to let me just waffle on for an hour. So it was just really, really cool to have that chat with her. So thank you, Jan. All right, before we wrap it up, as mentioned at the beginning of the podcast, new single is out, United. Welcome back. Uh, You can go to lord.net.au slash united. That's the first single off our brand new album, Fallen Idols, um, and that'll be out at the end of April. Uh, So you can go and check that out. And if you enjoy it or you enjoy any of our music, please share it around. We're trying to get all the hype and everything happening for this new album. It's been a long time uh, between them. So we're really, really excited to get it out there and share this music with as many people as possible. So any help would mean a hell of a lot to us. Uh, also, self-starter, as mentioned, and you guys will be well and truly aware, uh, we're in the middle of a break between season one and season two. Season two is going to kick off in June. Um, please keep the guest recommendations coming. I've had some really, really good ones so far. So um, I'm already starting to uh, build up a bank of episodes for season two, which is going to kick off in June. So if you know anybody out there that's got their own business um, or somebody that uh, has a really interesting, or it doesn't even have to be that interesting, just uh, anybody out there that earns a little bit, a bit of extra pocket money. Oh, come on, Andy. A bit of extra pocket money, a bit of a side hustle, um, anything um, that sort of ticks those boxes for self-starter, being small business, self-employment and freelancing. um, I'd love to hear from you. So flick those recommendations over. Go and check it out, selfstarter.com.au. And that's it, folks. Um, I'm sure there's a bunch of other things happening. By the time you listen to this episode, when it comes out, I will be in New York. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm recording any episodes over there. I've hit up a bunch of people, but um, yeah, I didn't get a lot of bites back, but um, you never know taking my gear over so we'll see what comes of it but um anyway until next week folks i've got a few in the bag so get ready i've got some great guests coming up as uh, you have already seen over the past several weeks over the past three and a half years of course anyway enough from me goodbye